Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by Boxing Hall of Famer and Boxing Instructional Wizard, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, Ken. That's uh first thing I want to do, say happy birthday. Uh, you... Uh you look great for 70, let me tell you. <laughs> and we, uh, we always have a sense of humor here on this show that people expect that. But uh, thank thank goodness for those athletic greens. They Hell really, yeah. they have preserved you well. <laughs> they have preserved you well, my friend. But no, what what is it? Well, is it? There it is, there it is. I'm, I'm not surprised. You never go anywhere without it, no, including no. recording. You never know when no. you need an emergency shot. Or into your 70th <laughs> birthday. Um what are, what are we, 51 was self Fifty one, yep, 51. Right. I'm on the back nine, Teddy. Figure I got nah. 100 in me. <laughs> no, nah, you're, you're looking good. You, you're running marathons. You're enjoying life. You have a beautiful family. Um, you have a new career here uh, that who would have knew? Like my friend Brian Kenny says uh, when he does his commentating. Now, now of course, in... MLB, it used to be with ESPN, but he used to say, who knew? Who knew? You know, see, I give credit to commentators, <laughs> if you notice, Footnotes. that actually originate <laughs> things, <laughs> unlike some, but it's okay. It's okay. Well, I will say one thing to your credit is when you're so prolific with the... Um with this, the commentary and the sayings and the slogans that it's easy for people to hijack them. And, you know, I think that when people are spewing that stuff or repeating it, it's easy to convince yourself that ah, no one's going to remember who was the originator of this. And they just tend to say it. It's I, I, I think it's as much laziness as it is irresponsibleness when you know you're using someone else's catchphrase or slogan, not to just be like, you know, as the great Teddy Atlas would say, you know, even occasionally it would be nice to sprinkle them in just like, Nah, you know, quick acknowledgement as to as a, as a, as opposed to never mention where you got all these sayings. But yeah, listen, <laughs> I listen, digress. It, no, I appreciate it. Uh, that's wish this would be the most biggest thing for me to worry about. That's a life, very you good know what point. I mean? That's a very good point. And to your point about the marathons and everything else, nothing has. Um, made me happier or been more rewarding than having the opportunity to do this show with you, honestly, because it's not just the show, it's it carries over into everything. And to that point, when I, I went to the fight Saturday, Serrano Taylor, and just the, the love and support from the fans, it honestly, it like, it's so humbling to me, like it could almost move me to tears that people are so kind, they wanna take a picture, talk to me, you know, in my mind, I'm like, you know that I'm I'm a joker, just like you. I just happen to have met Teddy and he, and he allows me to do this with him but my opinion is the same as yours about boxing and fighting it's like so i'm incredibly appreciative the carryover that it's had into my everyday life including my professional life has been beyond words in terms of what i've gotten out of it so thank you to everyone thank you to the fans and teddy before we start i just want to say one thing to to some of the fans people when they see me couldn't be nicer and, and, and when people send me messages on Instagram, Twitter, I try to engage with everyone. If you take the time to say something to me, good, bad, or indifferent, I try to give a response, even if it's some kind of acknowledgement. But recently, some, someone sent me a message, and I just want to take a second to say, if we don't do something that you don't, if we do something you don't like, or we don't cover a topic you don't like, there's no reason to send me a nasty message, man. If you wouldn't send, you wouldn't come up to me and say that to my face. So when you say like last week, we didn't do an in-depth cover, in-depth preview of the Taylor, Taylor Serrano and um, Shakur Stevenson and a Vasquez fight, um, uh, sorry, Valdez. And, um, you know, okay, maybe that wasn't your liking, but someone sent me a message and was like, you guys have changed, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And I said to him, man, is this really what you wanna do? Do you think you're being a good person by sending me this on a Friday night saying, you didn't do what I would have done, therefore I'm mad at you and I don't like you. Like, really, buddy? How about just like, hey, it would have been nice if you covered that, to which I would have said, fair point, they're big fights, but I don't know if you know, but there was a huge mega heavyweight fight. I don't know if you know how much more attention. It's like the Super Bowl of boxing. So I, I apologize that we didn't get everything in. But to send me a nasty message, dude, grow up. Don't do that shit. Like, I, I, I treat you with respect. Treat me with respect and I'll engage with you and tell you what the rationale was. Anyway, I digress. Send me ma nice messages. We'll engage. But be nasty to me. I'm just, like, going to ignore you. Anyway, how'd well, you... Well, actually, actually, first of all, if they had... The week before that, we did cover it 
more comprehensively, number one. We covered it quickly last week because we had covered it the week before, Mm -hmm. and we had the other things going on, as you just talked about, the heavyweight fight, which was pretty freaking big, and we had the interview with (laughs) Serrano's promoter, Jake Paul, and we covered it there. And if you listened last week where we did the shorter coverage, I would think that he'd be kind of happy if he went to my bookie because we gave him two winners <laughs> and, and and explained why they were going to win, both of them, Yeah, what, uh, to pretty good detail. You know, not that I expect to come on here and blow our own horn, but sometimes you got to say something and, you know, actions speak louder than words. So getting it right, we don't always get them right. I, I'm the first to remind people of that. But we got it right, and we got it right why they were going to win. Where both fighters, I felt Taylor, and I felt, of course, Stevenson were more well-rounded, and they were better defensive fighters. You know, even though some people are going to say, oh, well, you know, Taylor got caught in that fit. Yeah, yeah. But on the whole, her defense, her leg movement, her countering ability, her quick hands uh, were able to get her win over a much more physical fighter and a better puncher. Uh, And Stevenson, yeah, his defense was the difference. His completeness as a fighter was the difference. But we'll go into that in detail uh, to make sure that your friend doesn't get upset. (laughs) We will will, will cover that (laughs) over the next hour or so. I think think the reason I took it so personally is because the guy usually like engage with me and send me a nice message. I sent him and I, you know, small talk, but then to get like all up in my face, like you didn't cover that you guys are changing. I don't know what you think you're doing. I I was like, dude, number one, if you don't (laughs) like it, you don't have to listen. I I don't want to be a jerk, but like buzz off, man. Like you. But, it was but they're all listening. Ken, at the end of the day, they're all listening. Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah, the, just... the ones, the ones, listen, you gotta, the ones that don't like it, they're still listening. Yeah. The ones that love us, which we appreciate the heck out of them, they're still listening. And the ones that get upset, we appreciate them too, <laughs> because, they're, because they're listening, because they're yeah. on. And, and listen, we're doing very well. Our numbers are getting close to 250,000 subscribers for a pretty new podcast. That's yeah. pretty darn good. I, I feel proud that we've been able to do that, and I feel grateful uh, yep. that that we've been able to do that. Now, more importantly, yeah. before we even start with the fight, how did you get there? <laughs> how did you get to Madison Square Garden, the mecca of boxing? That's what our fans want to know right now. Yeah, I got a lift from a guy in my neighborhood who has a, a single... A lift, a lift <laughs> everyone. Go ahead. Go ahead. A single right engine away. Uh, turboprop plane and uh, flew me up there last minute. was like, hey, you're going to the fight? I know. He said, you want to go for a, fly, a flight? And he's been asking me to go flying with him. And I said, actually, we should fly to New York and check out the fight. And he said he couldn't stay over. Nice to have neighbors like you. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so Continue. He, he drove me. He flew me up there. And then I took a flight home, a commercial flight home in the morning. And uh, yeah, it was an adventure to say the least. I went, I went, ended up going last minute, saw a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of my friends sat with the guys from Super Coffee and uh, Jim Shark, my friend Devin Levesque. Oh, it was it was fantastic. Uh, Jimmy DeChico, the founder of Super Coffee, just all super nice guys. Oh, the best part, uh, saw Rosie, the great Rosie Perez, and her husband Eric Hayes, who I absolutely love, and they are queen of boxing. Rosie, the queen. the queen of New York boxing. And hey. Teddy, she's so her and her husband are so selfless and so generous when they see me. You know, in between fights, they have like a beautiful VIP like restaurant with. It's like another world. You walk out of the garden and into this little thing. James Dolan had the one, the little suite beside us, underneath the stands. So Rosie was like, "Come on in," and the security was like, "No, no, this guy can't come in. Like he's he, this guy's a nobody." And Rosie's like no 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 he's with us so we went in there and i'm like oh my god it's like a spread of sushi it was like a nobu in there <laughs> so i'm sitting there eating the sushi and i was like man what a life and again i think about if i wasn't here with you i wouldn't have such a good relationship with rosie and be it it was just i you know when that stuff happens i'm like oh my god i'm so lucky i'm the luckiest person in the world and um thank you to rosie and uh, eric for um they always look out for me when they see me at the fights and it was just a, an incredible night but let's get into that fight because 
Whew. I mean, that was as loud. Rob and I were lucky enough to be at the garden at the time. Um, we helped Ruiz beat Andrew Anthony Joshua. Um, you helped him. The- <laughs> You're the one who helped him. <laughs> well, Rob was you- telling me what to say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we um, we you noticed that he was a little lethargic. Yeah. You noticed that he was being forced to wait. AJ uh, was a little icing bit him. like yeah, a little bit, uh, a little bit like Fury forced Dillian White. Uh, White. Yeah, to wait, you know, with with all the theatrics and you know all the uh, the ring walk stuff, um, you you saw that Ruiz was being forced to wait for Joshua that night. He was getting a little cold, and you reminded him to stay warm, to yep. keep moving. We were sitting in like the third row, and I'm not. He was, you know, he's there. We're close. So as he stand there, there's a little lull in between like the 25 songs that Anthony Joshua played in his walkout. I just yelled to him, Andy, and he looked right at me, and I said, "Dude, stay warm, keep moving." And then I start shadow boxing, kind of winks, and look what happened. He ends, wins by knockout. But it uh, is. I, so, I hope. Uh, I, I hope at least something appreciative was sent in the mail. I hope so. Yeah. I hope be- at least <laughs> at least a nice Christmas card. Yeah, he got that sponsorship with Snickers Bar after the uh, game. I thought maybe I'd get a case of Snickers or something. Any of them left over? <laughs> Actually, it looks pretty good recently. It looks like maybe the first six months after in the rematch, it looks like he might have had too many of them, but he looks to be fit now. But I got to give, before we get into the fight, got to give huge credit to um, Jake Paul and Eddie Hearn. Well, love him or hate him, man, this event was was unbelievable everything about it it was organized there was right amount of security it was and uh speaking to eddie hearn i saw him the next day running in uh central park with his full kit on i got up super early before i went to took my flight home and there's eddie hearn sweating to the oldies out there full sweatshirt uh long pants he's he's lost a lot of weight he actually looks pretty fit so congratulations uh sir hearn of um (laughs) sir eddie of hearn (laughs) He looked good, but um, yeah, the fight was oh my god, the place was electric. The porter, hey, give credit. I'm gonna just piggyback on that. Give credit, as you just said, Eddie's been around obviously his father first, um, and then Eddie, Eddie's been around doing a a, well, obviously a very good job, and uh, and took this this woman's fight to new heights i mean it's oh, the yeah. first time ever uh that women have headlined madison square garden that's a that's a hell of a statement that's a hell of a yep. first and just terrific job by him with katie taylor and a great job by the newcomer to the business jake paul i mean he's yeah. a newcomer to the business and and you talk about starting out uh with something big mm. you, say you, you know starting out with something pretty special he sure as heck did that you know and and did a hell of a job with Serrano. Uh, the two of those women, to get them paid that way, to get this kind of attention. Uh, and then they came through. They came through. Oh, my goodness. You talk about coming through with aces, uh, flying colors. They came through. But to get them there, to get this kind of promotion, both promoters uh, did a fine job. Yes. And like I said, Sir Edward Sir Edward of Hearn, as as Vince Cummings would say, I love that nickname for him. He did a great job. But yeah, to your point, Jake Paul, I mean, obviously we had him on the show specifically to talk about this fight and everything he's done for it. So credit to all of them and credit to the two fighters because, I mean, we're going to get to the fight, which was, I mean, you, you couldn't have a better fight in terms of just action, but I will give them even more credit for the way they conducted themselves before, during, and after this fight. The buildup was great. They were both supremely confident, but incredibly respectful of each other. And Amanda Serrano said it multiple times, like, we don't have to talk nasty to each other. I'm, I think I'm going to win. She thinks she's going to win. And let's have at it. They got in the ring. And I mean, it, it, looked, well, it might as well have been a fight to the death. That last round, they just stood there punching each other in the face, like trying to will each other to victory. And um, the interviews after, credit to them both they both were total class um you know i i that fight i thought it could have gone any way i know you thought taylor win it but i wouldn't have been i didn't think it was a robbery i don't think it would have been a robbery if serrano had gotten it i could have i think katie won but i could have seen someone making an argument for serrano she had her hurt badly in the fifth and i'll tell you well somebody did one of the judges yeah. did Katie, one of the judges it was a split decision <laughs> yeah 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 of course and and in that last round if you look closely i mean katie taylor's knee was inches off the mat she got clipped with a good shot and those 
crazy exchanges. Uh, had she had her knee touched the ground, we might be looking at a different result here, but it didn't. And um, just the interviews and everything. And, and one quick thing I saw, Katie, um, Amanda Serrano sent a video to um, her manager the day after the fight yesterday, showing her on the scale. And she was literally two ounces heavier than where she weighed in after rehydrating overnight, drinking water, basically implying like, I was way fighting at a much higher weight than my natural weight is, I think, what yeah, the implication... Yeah, but you know what? Weight doesn't equate to other physical assets and physical advantages and 100, physical strengths. 100%. Uh, it, it, it doesn't. So, yeah, okay, so she's a bigger woman uh, or the smaller woman going yep. into the fight, but she was the stronger, the physically stronger woman yeah. and, and the better puncher. So, again, the weight doesn't equate the way that sometimes people want you to think it does or suggest that it does or have the public go really be brought along you know, with the implications. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the implications of what you just touched on. Oh, she's, you know, she's the biggest, stronger woman. No, she's not. Yeah, she fought at a higher weight. Again, I, I, I give you that. But the stronger woman, the more physical woman, the better puncher was definitely Serrano. Yep. And, and Taylor deserves credit for being able to overcome that and be able to deal with that and come up with a plan to deal with that. Yep. And to your point, um, Serrano, to me, from my perspective, being at the fight, it looked like Serrano was pressing the action all night, constantly coming forward. But Katie Taylor's counter punching was just incredible, where she'd get off like three or four counter punches, incredibly accurate. But Serrano's pressure was relentless. It started to dwindle late in the fight, which I think is where she lost it. But at that, that fifth round, I thought she was going to stop her. She had her banging her from pillar to post. And uh, that last round like i said katie's tail katie tails need just avoided going down clipped i think i don't think serrano was ever hurt nearly as bad as the few times that katie was rocked but credit to them both the way katie taylor came back from that fifth round i'm sure her corner was like okay it's we gotta go now like she had her hurt and uh oh i just can't say enough good things about it but i'm dying to hear your full analysis so with that let me turn it over to you how'd you like it listen the women stole the night they stole the night and um how far they've come. It wasn't all that long ago that people, you know, didn't want to watch women boxing. They, you, know, you had to struggle to get it on, to get it seen and to get it on television. I, I was there. I was there years ago with Friday Night Fights where we would put women boxing on where nobody really did. And, you know, and there was, you know, there was a, two sides to the, to the coin there as far as thinking went with that some people were not for us putting it on other people of course were and by um, the way teddy one quick thing i saw um our friend um the coal miner's daughter christy martin and she sends her best she says she's looking forward to coming on and talking to her talking to us about her book she yeah we're great. gonna have her on yeah she we're gonna have great. on actually yeah she's a she's a good woman and a special woman and a pioneer yeah uh, she's going to be on our show. She's getting inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame, deservingly so, June 6th. And we'll have on that, you know, uh, whether it's that date or that week, we'll have on. But she fits in here because she should take a bow. She should take a bow too because to get it to this point, there's always somebody who paves the way. You know, Muhammad Ali paved the way in great extent for these fighters getting the just huge purses uh, that they never would have gotten if somebody didn't pave the way. Ali paved the way. Uh, free agency in baseball, you know, Catfish Hunter, and I'm um, trying to remember the name of the other baseball player uh, that paved the way uh, for, for free agency, which now, of course, is, you know, it's, it's the way of life. It's the way of life in sports. But it wasn't. There was a time it wasn't that you <laughs> you you didn't make that kind of money. You couldn't make that kind of money. Uh, you couldn't even argue it. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you'd be out of work. So there are always the pioneers. And Chrissy Martin should feel proud about that night. That she is definitely a part of pioneering that that journey to Madison Square Garden where women can not only be the main event for the first time, but can make the kind of money and, and draw the kind of crowd uh, that they did. 
You know, Layla Ali. Uh, she's part of that too. She came on after Christy Martin, but you know her, her name, her ability. Uh, she she did her work on ESPN. I was calling her fights, and when she took that that journey uh, to making her father proud and 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 again making women's boxing more uh, enjoyable and more front and center. Uh, and and just more acceptable to people. Uh, she was part of that. She she kind of took the baton uh, from Christy Martin and was able to take it uh, to where she took it. Uh, so it was a great night for women for women boxing. Uh, and again, boy oh boy, they didn't miss the opportunity to really really bring the curtain down. Uh, I. You know, Serrano's a southpaw. She's a, she was the better puncher going in. We picked these ones right. I I said when we talked to Jake Paul, he asked me. He asked me on the air, on our interview. That's still out there if people want to see it. Uh, Teddy, who do you like? I said, I, I like Taylor. I, I think that uh, Serrano is a tremendous offensive machine, offensive fighter, which she was. Very aggressive. But I think that Katie Taylor is a more complete package. That she's she's she can counter, she can box, she can use the ring, she can use her legs to take up any part of the ring she needs to take up to avoid some of the aggression, maybe some of the power of Serrano, even though she, she wound up running into it definitely in the fifth round which it went to a character that she was able to survive that. We always talk about that, behaving like a champion. When the time came, she knew how to fight like a champion. She knew how to behave like a champion. They both behaved like champions, to be quite frank. But going in, my analysis was that, that Serrano would be aggressive. She'd be the stronger fighter physically. She'd be the, the better puncher. Uh, obviously, the southpaw that Katie Taylor would have to box. Uh, and would have to overcome something. She did. You usually do in those kind of fights, and she did. Uh, that's where her character spoke loudly. Uh, but Katie Taylor, I felt that she, again, she's an Olympic gold medalist with all that experience, all that confidence, around her very confident, but with all that experience, having dealt with so many styles, uh, having so much you know, experience at high level. Uh, I, I really, I really felt that she would have the edge, and it would be a, a really good fight. Well, it turned out to be a great fight. I think the, I think the difference to start with this analysis uh, was a little bit with, obviously, always with the individual athletes, but something to do with the corners. Uh, it seemed like Taylor had the better fight plan overall, where she understood what she was dealing with. As we just explained, as I explained before the fight, she's dealing with somebody who's a better puncher, and she's dealing with someone who's going to be very aggressive and physical. And she had the strategy to to deal with that she knew she needed a leg she knew she needed counter punching she also knew she needed to throw good straight quick right hands against the southpaw that can be successful with lefties i used the code when i was doing the fights on espn the southpaw killer and she she understood that she'd have to pot shot use her legs let her legs be part of the defensive measurements but also part of the offense, delivering the offense off the legs real quick and then getting out real quick. She made one mistake. She made a mistake in the fifth round where she decided to slug. She decided to stay inside with the, with the stronger fighter. And her idea for it was right. People are going to, are going to their eyebrows are going to go up right now. And they're going to say, what do you mean, Ted? Because she almost got knocked out. Yes. But her idea was that her punches were a little sharper and it was just a little bit extra fat on the punches of Serrano, a little wider, and she felt she could beat it to the punch. She could punch inside and sit in a pocket. And she wasn't wrong, except 
you're playing a little bit of Russian roulette with that because the better punch only needs one shot. You need three, four, five, six, whatever. And you need to consistently do it all night. And you need not to make mistakes. The puncher can make up for mistakes, can overcome mistakes because they have that eraser. And that's where she was a little wrong. She, she went with her nature, which is great, to go and get her thinking she could do that on the inside and her competitiveness and she almost paid a price for it. Now, the plan for Serrano, for me, I'm not trying to knock anyone, but I'm trying to do my job and say what I saw and what I believe, not worrying about anything else except say what I believe to be the truth from my experience of almost 50 years in boxing. And from what I could see, it's almost as if they thought that it was a fade out complete, that they're going to win the fight, they're the stronger fighter, the, the better puncher, and the, in their minds, the, the more dominant offensive fighter, and that they're going to, they're just basically going to set up as a fight plan to go burn the village down. Like, go in there and burn the village down, and, and uh, seek and destroy. That's it. To me, that should never be your complete fight plan. And and it again, maybe it wasn't that. But for what I felt and what I saw, what I witnessed, that's what it looked like. And throughout the night, nothing varied there. Like they never said, faint a little bit. Uh, get that counter punch out of the way. Then come in. Act like you're coming in the front door. Come in the side door because she's ready for you in the front door. They just took for granted that Serrano was the stronger fighter and she would prevail because of that. And she had a great chin. And let me touch on the chin. <laughs> they both have great chins and great hearts. Hearts of lions. Female lions, lions. Just the same. But, wow. Uh, let me tell you something. People did not understand or give credit to the chin on surround. Now, I understand. She's the puncher. She definitely put Katie uh, Taylor into a, a hurt position, a hurt mode where it was obviously, uh, it was obvious to everyone, her power and the impact that her power could have on someone when, when she catches them with, with her punch clean. But what you didn't notice was it was like a typhoon rainstorm of punches, like a hailstorm of punches that were poured, rained on the chin of Serrano. There were some spots where Serrano was coming in and pop, 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 pop. These punches were bouncing off her chin like raindrops off a windshield. It was, I, I'm telling you, it was amazing. Nobody took notice of it. All they did was say, oh, Serrano lands a big left. Oh, uh, there's the power of Serrano. But what do you think? What do you think that they were kisses from Katie Taylor? What, what, do, you, what do you think they were? You know, they were p p pop guns. With, you used to have that pop gun where the cork would come out, you know? <laughs> attached uh, you to think a string. That, yeah, attached <laughs> to a string. You think that's what was landing on Serrano's chin? They were punches. They were punches from an Olympic gold medalist, from an undefeated world champion, from maybe, if not the greatest woman fighter of all time, but definitely one of them, probably in the top three. Um, and they were bouncing off her chin <laughs> like like I said, like raindrops off a windshield. Like she had no regard for them. And and then she just walking through them. It was extraordinary. I was watching, I was saying, oh my God, somebody should point this out that, you know, she's getting hit too. <laughs> and and she's walking right through them. And then all of a sudden it changed. To me, that was that's that is really the story here, Ken. For me, that that is it. That everyone expected, especially the Serrano camp, for her pressure to break down, and her strength, to break down Katie Taylor. 
and it looked like it was going to happen in the fifth just to break her down, which we've seen before where that's part of the strategy. Just break the will and the physical being of this fighter in front of you by applying pressure until you finally break it. Just like, just like pressure breaks pipes in your house. Just keep coming. And it looked like that was going to happen. What nobody noticed was to how pure, re- just the resiliency of Katie Taylor, the ability to stay in there, the ability to come back, and the ability to throw volleys. I mean, I'm talking about bushels, <laughs> bushelfuls of counter punches and straight right hands to throw them and keep throwing them and keep landing accurately. And again, her resiliency, her, her will, it actually started to break Serrano. I don't think you touched on it, Ken. You touched on it by saying, you know, later on, she started to slow down. She started to get broken a little bit, just a little bit mentally and physically that those punches, the accumulation of those punches had that impact, had that effect. And you saw it. I saw it. It, uh, Katie Taylor saw it. Serrano felt it where it slowed. She started where the one we thought was going to break and almost did. She started to break. Like I used to always talk about this, somebody's chin is like a rock and you bang that rock, you bang and nothing happens, nothing happens. But you keep banging, you keep banging, you keep banging, you keep banging, you keep banging. And then all of a sudden, a chip comes off. I saw a chip come off just after all that banging. And part of it, the chip was the mental deterioration, erosion, <laughs> and, the, and the physical. And... But she behaved like a champion, Hubby and Serrano, and Taylor, every moment, every moment. And I thought, I know some people are going to say in the fifth round, if it was a three-minute round, well, it's not, okay? Now, if it was a three-minute round, do I understand that Taylor would have been in a lot of trouble? Maybe got stopped? Maybe. We don't know. Maybe, because... Someone as magnificent as her with the depth, the depth of her character and her will, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But, yeah, if it was a treatment around, it, it would have been even more dicey. Let's put it that way uh, in, that, in that fifth round. Uh, for them, but it's not. And What's that expression? If my aunt was my uncle, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, well, I I left that one out this time. But the, you, you, hey, credit to Amanda Serrano. She she suggested three minutes, wanted three minutes. But um, yeah, it it is a little bit disappointing. I mean, the men fight three t- twelve minute round three twelve three minute twelve rounds, uh, and in the UFC. The fights are the same. The women and the men fight the same duration in the rounds. I think it's just inevitable that in time, the women's fighting is, has evolved so much that they Maybe. deserve the same time, in at least for the rounds. You don't want to go 12, okay, 3 by 10. I'm cool with that. But the two minutes just goes by too fast. The thing that I say here is you use the word disappointing. You know what was disappointing? There was nothing about that fight that was disappointing. That's where I'm, I'm going to say that Anyone who used that word, they're wrong. There's only one area that was disappointing. To hear those commentators not give any credit early in that fight, especially early, later they did, to what Taylor was doing. I know what Serrano was doing. She was coming forward, trying to land the power punch of a southpaw, her back left hand. But, my God, Ken, Ken, I mean, uh, am Am I the only, was I watching a different fight than these commentators that gave no credit? You didn't see it. You were there. So you didn't see the TV of it and the graphics of it. But they put up a, a scorecard that I thought it was, I, I, I couldn't understand it. I was like, wait a minute. Maybe they, they were, maybe that's an old scorecard from another fight or something that I didn't (laughs) see. But they put up a scorecard that didn't even have Taylor in the fight. And she won early rounds. They only gave her the late rounds. And when I saw that scorecard and to listen to their commentating, 
you would have thought there was only one woman in that ring, Serrano. You would have thought that somehow, I even said, I said, I, I went to a fight and I didn't expect to see a, a television miracle where one of the fighters was turned into the invisible woman. <laughs> the invisible I know Claude Rains was the first invisible man he was I don't so I'm gonna put down for people out there that want to grab this and get his book of records if you're listening I want to put down that Katie Taylor is the first woman's invisible uh, first invisible woman <laughs> uh, of note of note because they turned her into the invisible woman during that fight they really did and I don't know how anyone could argue with me if they're going to be fair, no matter who you're a fan of. If you're going to be, and listen, these these guys are good commentators. They know what the hell they're watching. I mean, uh, what the what the sport is and what, but they're scoring. Either there's either they have trouble scoring, which is hard sometimes to sit at ringside and score a fight if you're commentating. I've been there. I know. It can be hard. Either that or there was a bias. I'll say the first one then, okay? Be because there's got to be some explanation for calling that fight where the only blows they seem to register and talk into that microphone were the ones coming from Serrano. That somehow they didn't see all those right hands landing you saw them at your, where you were sitting, right, Ken? Yeah. You yeah, saw yeah. them. Uh, I mean, you didn't have a problem, did you? I mean, yep. you you saw the competitiveness of the fight. Yeah, the other ones were harder. But I'm telling you, a lot of those left hands from Serrano that they were screaming about, they weren't landing. And here's my proof to that. My proof is my eyes. But I'll tell you where my proof is to make my argument. When they did land, she got hurt badly she yeah. overcame it in the fifth round if they were landing the way they were calling them to be landing from early on she never would have survived the fight mm -hmm. because we already know what happened when they did land <laughs> she never would have finished that fight they weren't landing not but they were calling them like they were all landing and not calling just ignoring the fuselage of punches Right hands, left hook, especially right hands, straight quick. Ba -ba -ba! Right hands that were bouncing off the chin of Sarah. There was like no mention of that. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't bring that up. Because yeah. really, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing my job. Uh, because we want people to get better. I don't know if that'll make them better or, or not make them better. But we, we want people to get better. And I thought Taylor won the fight. Uh, it was a hell of a fight. It was. It was. I. I started thinking maybe it's going to be a draw. I started thinking, but oh, at no I thought point, when the fight ended, I was like, "Oh, I wish I had money on the draw." And Rob, Rob sent us a text saying the same thing. But I thought for sure they were going to get a draw. I don't know why, but I was like, "Yep, yeah, this is a no, draw." Well, I to understand. get another fight because they should fight again. They could fight it once. Yeah, a, once but, every but six months. But you shouldn't months. do something just to get another fight. The, the oh, no, fight I enough. I, the fight was enough to get another fight, and it and it'll probably happen in Ireland. With, with Katie Tail, but let me say something else, and it'll be an unbelievable atmosphere. Unbelievable. Matter of fact, start buying stock in Guinness right now. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of pints of Guinness over there for 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 the Lady of Ireland, uh, 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 Katie Taylor. I mean, she's she's a star. She deserves to be. She she's a, a, a basically should be a national hero over in Ireland with between everything she's done in her career and now this fight and bringing women's boxing again. With and I give credit to all the other women too, but for her part in bringing women's boxing to this point, uh, it'll be an extraordinary event. There should be should be treated like like a hero and like a star that she deserves to be. Uh, what an atmosphere to be. Uh, what a big fight. What a big payday for both of them again. And they all, and they deserve it. But I have to say this, something was left in the ring by both women in that kind of fight. Let me tell you, nobody understands that better than me. Something where we don't think about it. We just think about the glorious fight we witnessed, what they gave us, how, how, appreciative we are of what they gave us what we witnessed but there was parts of them just like the thrill in manila with ali and frazier there's parts of a fighter in those kind of fights that are left in the ring
there was definitely a part of both women left in the ring. I believe probably more of Taylor because of two things. One, the impact, the power behind those punches. Um, and the other, even though the accumulative effect is great, and, and that Serrano took that accumulative uh, punishment. So you can't not understand or underestimate that. But Taylor has more miles on her odometer. Between all the amateur accolades, all the amateur fights, the gold medal in the Olympics, everything else, she has more miles and than Serrano does. And she could be impacted more by that fight than Serrano, who maybe recovers from it a little better. Uh, that's something that nobody's going to talk about. Nobody's going to think about until now. But it's something that I bring up because, again, I'm aware of it. If I'm aware of it, I should bring it up. I understand uh, the perils of my business. I understand the impact of my business, what it means going in a ring for 10 or 12 rounds and taking punches. Where, where, in the end, what it means and what it does. So that's something, that's, that's a factor that, it's definitely in the air. It's definitely there. It's definitely uh, something to be thought about, uh, for the obviously for the rematch. I would say this, that the crowd at, at Madison Square Garden was as close to 50-50 as you're going to get for both women. At one point late in the fight, they were just chanting, let's go, Katie. And I mean, it was overwhelming. The Amanda fans tried to respond, but they Katie Taylor's fans were drowning them out. But prior to that, you know, it was 50-50. Oh, my God, it was. The Puerto Ricans and the Irish were out in full force. I didn't, the other thing I want to point out, I didn't see any, like, you know, when you get a crowd like that, it can get volatile, especially at a fight, you know, and skirmishes break out. But it seemed like, for the most part, it was, like, good behavior all around, not just from the fighters, but from the fans. And literally, it was a who's who of fighters. I already mentioned Christy Martin was there. But um, I saw Clarissa Shields. I saw... Uh, um, Molly McCann, the UFC fighter, sitting over with Dave uh, Portnoy from Barstool Sports and Big Cat. Just like an awesome crowd all around. Um, and by the way, David Diamante sends his best wishes to you. Glad to see him back in action. Their ring announcer for the zone recovering after a tragic, terrible, terrible motorcycle accident. Broke his back, his arm, everything. Yeah, he was super, super appreciative. He said you gave him a call afterwards. He was like, oh, tell Teddy I said hello. Just a really nice guy. It was always... It it was always nice seeing him. And um, that was a great job, too. Yeah, great job. Um, well, from there, let's jump over to Vegas and kudos to the promoters, I, you know, for getting this thing right so you could see both of the fights. So I rushed back to uh, the house and got to see the um, the um, Shakur Stevenson, Oscar Valdez fight. And uh, we didn't really need judges there as it was a one 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 sided uh, blowout. I thought for Shakur Stevenson, he just seemed too strong, too big, just overwhelmed Oscar Valdez all night from uh, from what I could see. Again, I was trying to watch it on my phone because I was. I want to add home. one thing. Can I yeah. add one oh, thing? Of course. Look, looking at my notes. That's why I make notes. Thirty one pages, by the way, <laughs> but. I, I go off my head, I go spontaneous, I go off for what I saw, what I mean, but the notes are good to remind you of something once in a while that, you know, that sometimes you might miss, the optics. Yeah. yeah. The optics, the optics. And what do I mean by that? I think people are influenced by optics, whether it's judges, commentators, fans, and I think, I'm not making an excuse for the commentators, I'm just saying I thought they, they got it a little wrong, even though they, they usually get it right and they're, they're they're very good at what they do. All right, here. When you saw the optics of Katie Taylor after the fifth round, fifth round after the fifth round of being bloodied, hurt, cut, nose, all of that, you, the optics were not good. And it kind of coincided immediately it, it kind of matched up with what you thought might happen. She's getting worn down. She's getting broken down by the harder puncher, the more physical fighter. Uh, she's getting the worst of it. And your brain latches onto that, that 
that is proof of what you what is happening, what you thought might happen. Um, and she looks, you know, she looks tethered, tethered. She looks, you know, broken a little bit. She looks in trouble. And then she goes out in the following rounds, makes the adjustment, shows the championship character, and gets right back to boxing, pot shotting, using the legs, quick right hands, countering, doing what she has to do to win rounds. And it's hard to separate and to now match up what you're seeing and the optics that are still in your head from what you saw. It's hard to really come to terms with that on the fly saying, forget the optics. Remember what's being done now. She's winning rounds. I think it's, I think it's hard sometimes for that. And I think that the media, the late rounds they got right, but the media around those rounds right there, six, whatever, seventh, uh, even even when the power was coming before the fifth round, where you kind of set yourself up that if Serrano's aggressive, she's going to be doing damage because she's that kind of fighter, that kind of offensive tidal wave force and she is and you and you start to see what your mind has already set up to see what what has already been kind of kind of lodged kind of put into your mind and between that and seeing the bloodied as i said little raggedy looking tailor after taking those punches in the fifth, it takes a while to readjust your your eyes and your mind to what's really going on, which is she's boxing, she's winning rounds. So I, I really do think that both the optics influenced possibly some of what people were seeing or thinking they were seeing, and also... Just the the pre fight mind of if she's aggressive, if she's chucking punches, if she's getting close, she's doing damage. Yet she wasn't necessarily doing that. She was being aggressive. She was doing some landing, but not to the extent that you kind of almost like you set yourself up to be sold on that. So I, 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 I always talk about the mental part in boxing being so important, 75% of it for a fighter, and it is. I think the mental part in, as a fan, as a commentator, is something that can also influence the outcome of a fight or the watching of a fight in your mind. Yeah, you know what? When you when you were given that uh, breakdown, and then the breakdown earlier in the fight of um, Katie Taylor, uh, her her counter punching ability, it reminded me that I wanted to mention to the fans: if you like the uh, breakdown and you're interested in learning some of the technicalities of boxing, please check out Dynamic Striking. Teddy has a whole uh, 15 video series over there that you can buy per video uh, that gives a full fundamental breakdown of all the punches and all the different techniques in boxing you can practice them in the safety and comfort of your own of your own home if that's where you're more comfortable learning boxing technique and um it's well worth the price of admission dynamic striking check it out and while you're doing that you can check out teddy's um uh clothing collection at box raw the 36 collection if you don't know teddy always says you got once you get in the ring for a championship fight you got 36 minutes to make life fair so check out the box raw collection uh the teddy atlas collection at boxraw.com 
and dynamic striking and please show your support uh means a lot to teddy means a lot to both of us so appreciate you guys teddy let's jump into the next fight where we didn't need a judge uh anyone with two eyes could have seen this um Shakur stevenson basically uh put on the performance that everyone's been looking for from him uh unified the titles uh to a certain extent and um you know put it on oscar valdez pretty good uh one-sided all night i thought i think the judges had it uh 118 109 two times and one and 117 110 it was really one-sided he looked great he controlled the action all night and uh you know valdez is super tough but unfortunately when you're just tough at that level you got to have everything in and Shakur had just too much talent for him how you, you like know it? all for what you just said about tough reminds me of what my mentor costamato used to say that you it's it's a prerequisite to be tough in this business. Some people are tougher. Some aren't tough enough. There's level of toughness. But one thing that is supposed to be is if you're in this business, there should be a level of toughness. And Cus would always say to me, Teddy, remember that when you have two tough guys in a fight and one is smarter, more developed if you want to, better technically, they automatically become tougher. And it's true. It's very true. Because they don't have to depend only on their toughness. And that was a perfect example of Cus's saying was that Stevenson was smarter. I'm not saying, you know, that uh, the other guy's dumb. I'm not saying that, you know, he's smarter academically. I'm just saying in the ring, his ring IQ is higher, has developed more. His, his approach, his, his technique has been better, better developed. And that was it. I picked Stevenson to win this fight. I didn't think it was going to be close. What I did say and think was that if it's a boring fight, a one-sided fight, you don't even have to look. You don't even have to ask. If, just don't even watch the fight. If, just say, is it is it boring a little bit? And is it one side? Yes. Okay. Stevenson's winning. Well, how did you know? Because it was easy to understand that for me. That Because that means it's Stevenson's kind of fight. Stevenson is a really complete fighter. It's not exciting. Now, I know people are going to argue. I said going into this fight, Stevens is the more complete fighter package, more dimensional. And one of the things I keyed on, Ken, if you remember, for both fighters, the women's fighter fight and this one, defense. Whoever has the better defense has an edge. Well, Stevenson had the better defense. And, again, the more developed offense. Uh, Valdez was depending on will, grit, and a reckless offense. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, again, I'm not here to knock no one. I'm here to tell things that the fans, I believe, if they want the truth, if they want to learn some a little extra, maybe, maybe, if I could do that, I don't know, uh, in, in what's going on, I need to present these things as I know. Uh, he was depending on toughness, will, grit, and an offense that's not as developed uh is is more raw of an offense more reckless again the word if the word fits it then it fits and yeah the other guy has fast hands i get all that but the ability the package of stevenson was the difference the package of being able to counter being able to lead being able to uh you know change range uh, defense being obviously much better. His style, what you watched was this. If I was commentating, that's the first thing I would have said. You have to understand what you're in there with. It didn't look like Valdez and his people, you know, and I know it's the great Eddie Reynoso. Can I, I get it. I get it. But I don't know. It didn't look like he really, maybe he's not good enough. Okay. Sometimes you're not good enough. But it didn't look like he understood exactly what it was dealing with. 
for me, before the fight started, this is what I felt and I saw. To just to validate what I felt was going to be the case, it came to life watching it. You come in, you being Valdez, you come in six inches, Stevenson goes back 10. <laughs> you come in seven inches, Stevenson goes back 11. And he counters. He fills the gap. And he keeps you one step behind him. And it's frustrating. And it's difficult. And it's a specific style. And I don't care if people don't like this because you're a fanatical fan. Good for you. I'm happy for you. I am. Go get some athletic greens so you could be a fanatical fan for an extra 10 years. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy for you. But don't argue that it's not a little boring because he doesn't have a fiery, scintillating side. That's his style. I said going into the fight, if you remember, I, I said all the technical things, all the physical components of what I thought would bear out. And I also said that Valdez has the more exciting style. Now, some people could argue, say, that's not exciting for me. That's whatever. But when he's matched with the right guy, it's pretty damn exciting. Stevenson doesn't have, he's got more of a subdued style, not the exciting style. Doesn't mean he can't be in an exciting fight, but you better have the right guy in there. Because his druthers, if he has his druthers, is going to be attached to his personality. Somebody's physical style is always attached to their temperament, to their personality, to how they think. It is. He Stevenson is a thoughtful, young person who thinks things out. He's cerebral, and he's careful. And he's got a right to be careful. It's a dangerous business. He's careful. He's, he's um, conservative to a certain extent, if you want to say, along with, goes along with being careful. But he's, he's definitely a guy that understands that you're supposed to hit, not get hit. That's a good thing. That's an intelligent guy. Not that Valdez don't understand that, but Valdez is willing to just, accept in his mind with his style and his abilities that you're going to have to take some to get some. You're going to have to take some to give some. Stevenson doesn't really think that way. Stevenson thinks that it should be a one-way street when it comes to that. That I should do all the hitting, you should do all the missing. <laughs> you should, I, I, <laughs> That's I, nice and you, and you should, Yeah, and you should do all the trying while I'm doing all the buying. And that's his mentality. We've had great fighters in the past with that mentality. Not always the most exciting style to watch. They have to be really matched with the right guy to get an exciting fight. But again, kind of like Muhammad Ali when he was young, there was a lot of fights that were not exciting. It was one-sided where Ali was just too fast, too smart, too cerebral, if you want to say, too quick with his hands and his feet too cognizant of really truly appreciating what the sweet science is about. Hit, don't get hit. That was Allie. And Stevenson's a whole different style. He's a southpaw. He sets his feet. He controls range by being set, not by, you know, motorcycling around the ring like Ali did when he was young. But the mentality is, and the confidence and his ability is very similar, very similar. And again, it's not a knock. There'll be some idiots out there, you know, that will say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. do you understand what that? I didn't understand it either, Ken, because that's how they sound. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand it either, Ken. But basically, <laughs> my interpreter for nonsense, I have an interpreter for nonsense. My interpreter for nonsense um, did break it down and and did tell me that it means oh you're knocking my guy uh you know you don't like my guy for different reasons 
No, I appreciate you guys for being a terrific fighter, for being able to do the things, be calm enough, deliberate enough, good enough, smart enough to get away with fighting his fight, this kind of style. I appreciate it. I understand it. I'm just bringing out a fact that the same as when you go to a baseball game. I've used this analogy before. It fits. So I use it again. You go to a baseball game and you want to see home runs. Most people want to see home runs. They want to see, you know, numbers go up on that scoreboard. But there are some that go there and they appreciate a boring game. And who could argue with me if it's a one nothing shutout that it's not a little boring, but it doesn't mean it's not fascinating. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's not fascinating to watch a pitcher with those kind of skills just disarm batter after disarm batter after batter. Take the bat right out of their hands. It's fascinating. It is to be able to 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 watch the ability. Not every pitcher can throw the ball 100 miles an hour. Now that's fascinating. See somebody blow the ball right past you and, and bang, hear the pop in the glove. Say That's exciting. That's almost like a home run. That's exciting. But to watch a guy who only throws a fastball 80 miles an hour and he goes in there and he takes the best hitters, the strongest hitters, and he sits them down one after another by changing speeds, by hitting corners, by mixing it up, by being calm and consistent and together mentally. Wow, that's fascinating. It is. And that's Stevenson. And, and again, some people go there to watch that. Some won't. But that's what you're going to see. That's my job. As a point of, and to give him credit, which I'm doing, for doing that. And he deserves it. And that's what he did. And it was a one-sided fight. It was the part that for me, and tell me if you could argue with me with this, Ken, because I don't think you can if you're being out. But tell me if you can. At the end, I wasn't entertained anymore. I didn't have hope of being entertained other than watching that picture and fascinated by, and I, and I appreciate that, obviously, how he continues to disarm the batter, disarm this fighter. But it got to a point where it was a cat and mouse game. I don't get any enjoyment. You almost have to be sadistic if you get to a point where you like watching a cat play with a mouse that's a pretty pretty, that's a pretty good comparison that's what it was like just either go and get him or like let's do this it's just yeah to your but it's not his temperament to go get him he tried to the degree that he's capable of trying within his mentality stevenson he tried he did he tried to get rid of him to the point that he can try without getting to the restrictions of his personality, his temperament, of things that are no-nos, no-go places for the way he thinks, where you go beyond that point of risk, where now you're not being who you're supposed to be. He, He won't go past that. He came close, but he won't. Because that's what he makes his money on. That's what he is. That's why he's undefeated. That's why he's he's special right now or could be special. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Now why, Teddy, don't we know? Because with all that talent, and people can argue with me, his co-manager, one of his managers, who's a great fighter, and the commentator, Andre Ward, he's going to argue. I get it. I get it. I do. But that don't mean he's going to stop me from saying what I believe and making and putting forward an intelligent argument to back it up with experience and everything else that he hasn't been tested. Some He will say, other people will say, but Teddy, he was tested. I will say not yet. He hasn't been tested because his skill has been so far superior that his will hasn't yet been tested. 
It, it, it just hasn't been tested. Now, some people are going to say that's wrong. And then some people like Andre Ward, very intelligent, great fighter. He was a terrific fighter, gold medalist. I caught his fights in the Olympics. And uh, world champion, put together all the 160-pound belts with that tournament, moved up and won the light heavyweight belts, retired undefeated. Obviously, he doesn't need me to be his PR man. And he's a good commentator. But he's going to say, Teddy, and he kind of said it on the air, you don't have to show that dog in you to have dog. Now, of course, that's his reference to Will. That's his word, his way of saying what I say when I just say Will. Okay. Because when you have that dog in you, you don't have to get to that testing point because you got so much dog in you that the guy can't get to that place because of your dog, because of your determination, because of your stoutness in that area. <laughs> I disagree. I say that you're confusing that with skill and confidence. <laughs> that he's so skillful, so sure of himself, so calm in his domain that you don't get close enough to test his will. And, and because his level of skill is that far superior. And his level of confidence allows him to display that skill to that level. That, that, that is the difference for me. Um, and, and again, Andre will say, well, I did it. I was in a ring. I was a world champ. I know. I'm going to say this. Sometimes the ones who are great at what they do don't know what they're doing other than they're doing it. Really. I'm not saying he don't think he knows it. And maybe he I'm, I'm going out there now. I'm going out there to where I can be attacked. I don't care. Because I believe in what I believe. That the special, and I'm calling them special, okay? I don't call too many special. He, the special ones, like Ward was, they just do it. They can't really completely, because in their mind, they never got challenged. In their mind, they just did what they're supposed to do. They answered the bell. They got the job done. They won. They won. And at the end of the day, they don't dissect how they won. They were always going to win. <laughs> That's part of their greatness. They never doubted it. They were always going to find a way. They always got, it wasn't about uh, the dog came out tonight, the dog had to be released from his cage. <laughs> no, it wasn't about that. The dog was always there, and they, uh, there was never a doubt. He's wrong. I'll tell you where. Him. And I'm doing nothing, nothing but giving him accolades that I think he deserves. I was there calling a fight for ESPN. I was, well, I was reporting on a fight for ESPN for Sports Center. When he fought the first fight with Sergey Kovalev, his first fight, a lot of people thought he lost the fight. I thought he won by one point, and I said it on the air. But anyway, he got dropped in that fight. He was dealing with a different style. Very, he was having difficulty with the range, the length, the distance of Kovalev, who was a good right-hand puncher and a confident undefeated fighter. He was having difficulty with that i don't know if he went in there ready for that maybe he did maybe he didn't but the great ones deal with it as they have to and he dealt with it but this is what happened he was having trouble there's no doubt he was having trouble in that fight he was behind in that fight he had to make up ground in that fight you know how he did it the dog was released from the cage he's never going to say that he's going to just say i won i did what i had to do no, 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 no. The dog won that fight for you. If if we're calling the dog the will, as as I'm uh, explained that we are, the dog came out. When the dog, there was a dog whistle, nobody heard it, but it came out. You blew that whistle without subconsciously, but it came out. It won that fight for you. It made you go a little out of character. You're usually a counter puncher. You get off, but you also counter. You mix it up. You had to go get him. And you went. You got him. You had to go get close. 
and you did. You had to go right towards that right hand, the smart way, but you had to go in there to the, the den of the lion, the lion's mouth, and you had to go get him, and, and you did. You did. And you broke him a little bit. You did. Because he don't have the dog. And I again, some people are going to hate me. I don't care. What are you going to learn that? I care about telling what I believe to be the truth. It was proven in the next fight. Kovalev didn't have the dog. He had talent. He had terrific talent, style, confidence, everything else. But in the next fight, the rematch, it was Ward went and finished what he started, what he knew he had to do, what he was prepared to do mentally this time. Maybe he was in the first time understanding the danger of the guy, what the guy was, whatever. He went and he broke the guy, finished the job. Ward went in there and showed why he's a superior guy and why he's a special fighter. He broke the guy. He made him quit. A lot of people ain't going to. He made him quit. I agree yeah, he with hit you. Him in a, he hit him in the body, and he tried to act like, uh, Kovalev tried to act like he got hit low. Yeah, please, please. He, he made him quit because Kovalev never had that dog in him. And when the time came to show it, it wasn't there to show. So he didn't. He didn't. So like me, hate me, whatever, but at least listen to what I'm explaining, how I'm explaining it. Because like I said, it doesn't mean I'm right, but I do back it up with an explanation that makes it right for me, at least, that gives it a reason to be thought of as right, a plausible explanation. And we don't know if Stevenson, he might have that, but we don't know yet. We don't know yet because he hasn't been taken to that place by that guy. And I don't know who that guy is. I tell you one thing, he's not in the 130 pound weight class. That I can tell you. That I can tell you, he's not there. He's gonna have to go up to 135 to find him. He's, he's gonna have to go up there. And up there, I would love to see him in with Lomachenko. Two time gold, uh, uh, Ken. <laughs> Ken, you talk about a guy that maybe could put this jigsaw puzzle together because because Stevenson's a jigsaw puzzle. He he's a jigsaw puzzle and he's a difficult puzzle. But a guy who could put that together, Lomachenko, two time gold medalist from the Olympics. He knows how to win. He he he. he three division champion. He's a guy that's got that kind of confidence, but he's got something else. By winning two gold medals in the Olympics, he fought every style out there. And he had to figure it out. He had to figure out the key to every one of those styles to win two gold medals in two Olympics. Um, I would, I'll tell you, he's also a southpaw, would be two southpaws. Uh, I would, I, I'd, I'd pay to watch that one. It'd be all, I don't know if it's getting a little late in the game for Loman. Jack, I don't think it is. I would love to see you. And I'll tell you, again, the only guys that have a chance would be Haney, uh, Trevante Davis. He might be too small. And that's another X factor here that I'm mentioning. Nobody mentioned this, uh, or, or, or to the extent that I am, at least. Anyone notice how big Stevenson is? He's just big. He's good. But he's big. He, he's, he's not a big puncher, but he's big. He, he's... He was so much bigger than Valdez. He is a huge 130-pounder. And you know what? When he moves up to 135, and he will, he's going to have to. I can't see him physically staying at 130. <laughs> and he's not going to want to because the bigger fights are going to be, you're going to have to move up. And, and for your legacy, for your pocketbook, for everything. So I, he's going to be bigger than most of the 135-pounders. That's how big he is. How about and, seeing him with Ryan uh, Ryan Garcia? Uh, Garcia, well, uh, he's on my list. Look, they're the only ones. I mean, uh, again, Haney, Javante Day, Loman Chaco, I'd love to see that. I really would. And Garcia. Um, Cambosos. He might be too big. He might be too big for Davis. But I don't know. I, have, I, I think a lot of Davis. I think he's a lot more than just a real good puncher. He's a really good puncher. You know, punches are born, they're not made. He's born with power. But 
He's a good counterpunch. He's a good boxer. He's cerebral. He knows what the freak he's doing in there. He can make adjustments in there. His defense is good. It's responsible. He, he, he is a package. But the thing with Garcia, you know, is that I think, I don't know, Garcia's going through something. He's going through some kind of change uh, where he's got to decide, he's got to make a decision. Do I want to just be the best fighter I can be or do I want to be the most sellable fighter? There's a difference. Really. I, I get the ego. I get the youngness. <laughs> I get it. I get the followers that he's got with everybody and that he's almost like a De La Hoya matinee idol with the girls. And by the way, he sends his he sends his best wishes. I saw him at the fight and talked to him for a little while as well at the Serrano Taylor fight. Really nice kid. He's been on our show twice. Yep. I don't have people on my show, our show, if I don't think they're nice people. I yep. don't. You know that. That's right. I don't. And I like him. I like his family. I like him a lot. And, and his upside is huge. But he's got to, and this is just advice out of caring. I don't have to give this. He's got to decide, am I going to be the most sellable fighter or the best fighter? What do I mean by that? He's got to start taking fights, unlike the last one, which didn't serve him well. Not only that it didn't look good at the end or really great, but, but, but uh, he didn't learn nothing from it. He was just trying to knock the guy out. Like, like the only thing important was to get another knockout, another notch on the belt, because that sells. That sells my image. That sells, you know, whatever. And I disagree. I say pick the fights that are going to make you improve, that are going to teach you more of your craft that are going to make you a better fighter because ultimately that's what you're going to be judged on and that's what you're going to be paid on, how good a fighter you are. <laughs> so spend your time now fighting fights that will make you improve, will make you learn more, will make you become a better fighter rather than uh, rather than just a sellable you know, fighter. Go ahead. To your point, I hope that some of the other young fighters out there, because all those guys you mentioned, they have a tendency to like take some of those stay busy fights that aren't attractive. I hope they all watch that and realize that you can actually hurt yourself by taking a fight with someone who shouldn't be in the ring with you. At this stage of all the careers you named, let's go down at Devin Haney, uh, Garcia, Javante Davis, Vasily Lomachenko. I mean, he's always going to fight anyone who's available. Cambosos. No one wants to see you in a fight against someone other than the names I just mentioned. That's the only people that th those guys we only want to see them fight each other. I don't want to see Javante Davis fight someone else out of that list ever anymore. We've seen it. He can sell. I get it. He can keep putting on big shows, but come on, man. Step up. Fight these guys. The fans want it. If, if, if Look at what happened with Ryan in the last fight. He completely outclassed the guy, but I, like you said, I think his stock goes down when he's in there with a guy that he's completely outclassing. He's just chasing him around like, like Rocky chasing a chicken. It doesn't look good for anyone. I just hope they all see it and say, like, like, all right, enough with this. All those guys have developed enough where we know they're good. Everyone on that list is a killer. They're great. Let's have them fight each other. Like, look at what happened to the, the Four Kings, um, the, 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 the documentary that you participated in, Hagler, Hearns, Roberto Duran, and um, who am I missing? Hagler, Hearns. Who's Duran and uh, Leonard. Yeah, those guys, they fought each other and look what happened. They would talk about him like 20, 30 years later. They're making documentaries about them for being killers. Mickey Ward and Arturo Gotti had three fights against each other that were so competitive they made movies about it. Their whole career was defined by that. Mickey Ward, you know, was a, was a decent fighter, but he stepped up and took a huge fight against a guy who was probably out of his class and he showed everyone that that style was... was he could compete, and they, these guys made legacies and careers out of it. They, all these guys have made a lot of money, and they'll continue to make money. Now we want to see them fight the competitive fights. That's what people want. Anyway. I, no, no, I, I, I sat back and listened. No, no, you don't digress at all. You're making good points, and I sat back, and, and I just wanted to give you the room to do that and then just add one thing uh, that you mentioned. You mentioned about his stock, his being Garcia's stock fell uh, in his last fight. I'm going to add one thing to it that I think is just as uh, actually more important. His skill sets, his in-ring 
um, IQ, his in-ring abilities did not go up. No. That's the key. Yeah, his stock might have fell. You're 100% right. But more importantly, that will come right back. One performance, no yep. problem. More importantly, what didn't go up, forget about what fell. What didn't go up was his improvement in the area of being a fighter. The most important stock he has, his, his ability to fight, his IQ of boxing, his, his craft, the, the, just, the, just the, the abilities that he's going to cash checks with is how good he can fight in the ring, how, how complete a package he is. Those things didn't get a chance to be improved. And that's the most important thing he has is how good a fighter he is at the end of the day. In every area, that's what's most important. Not his stock, not his followers, not, not his charisma. That'll help him make money, I get it. But his ability to fight. See, that was the magic in the years ago in the 30s and the 40s, 20s, whatever, when fighters had 300 fights, 200 fights, and we're never going to have that ever. I get it. But losing a fight was not a death sentence. See, that's why there were so many great fighters with Sugar Ray Robinson, some people think the greatest fighter of all. All those fighters, Henry Armstrong, probably my favorite, and uh, uh, prob probably Henry Armstrong, uh, just a monster, monster of a man. Um, Sam Langford, another one. But anyway, you guys could Google them and see why I have so much appreciation and even awe for those fighters and the fighters of that generation and today too, obviously. But I'm talking about in what people call the golden years of boxing with guys like Mike Silva, who's a writer and a tremendous historian in boxing. What he talks about when he writes his books um, with those fighters losing was not a death sentence nowadays it almost is like you can't lose you got to navigate around pick the right opponent get on get on tv be with a promoter and be the chosen one be the golden boy get taken care of and, and be, have the upper hand on selecting opponents and stay undefeated because you'll make money the networks will continue to put you on see back in those days First of all, if you go back enough, there were no networks. But even when Gillette Cavalcade of Sports started and, and you had the Friday night fights and everything else and you had the fighters more and more, like Kid Gavilan, all these great fights, you had them on television every Friday and everything. It didn't matter if the guy showed up with three losses or five or even six or seven and one guy was undefeated or whatever. It didn't matter. You know why? Because you knew that they belonged. You knew that they knew their craft. You knew that they could fight because they had fought all the good fighters out there, Ken. And even if they accumulated a loss here and there, it didn't matter. What mattered was what they learned in that loss. And what, what mattered was where they stood themselves and proved. In that, they proved they belong at the top. They proved they belong in the ring with anybody. Anybody. And... They were granted that right to be in the ring in top fights in the garden or anywhere else because of that, because they proved themselves, because they had forged themselves through that fire of fighting top fighters, even when they lost, what they learned from it got them to the garden in a main event, got them to another world title fight, got them where people still filled the arenas to watch them. Because they learn how to fight. Because they got better. That, there should be more credence put to that with the managers and promoters than just keeping your guy undefeated. We'd have better fighters and more competitive fights instead of watching where sometimes you'll, you'll watch whether it's top rank or whoever it is. It's not just them, but where they use 
their network that they have to deal with, right? Uh, where they make their money, where they can p- get fighters to sign with them because say, hey, you come with me, you're going to be on ESPN, you're going to be on TV, you're going to be on this, you're going to be on that, whatever it is. Uh, so they get, they use it to sign them up. And then they go and they use the dates on TV with their stars, with their Olympic guys, with their amateur stars, with the guys they sign up. They go and they they just use the network for a farm system, a growing system, a growing field where they continue for the first two, three years when they turn them pro to put them in with subpar opponents to keep them undefeated, to show the network, hey, we got undefeated fighters, to show the fans, hey, we got this guy, we got that guy, we signed that guy, we signed that guy. Okay, but who are you putting them in with? (laughs) <laughs> you're not putting them in with anyone who's competitive we're watching boring one-sided beatdowns every week until every once in a while you throw a couple of your top guys in with each other you have to do it once in a while once, in a, once in a while would be a stretch i mean you can watch the ufc and see that their top three or five fighters have probably double digit losses conor mcgregor hasn't won a fight in five years he's the biggest draw in the ufc um uh, Nate Diaz, I don't know how many losses, maybe 13 losses. He fights, everyone's tuning in because you know you're going to get a dog. He's going to fight to like the death. And it, it, it's a shame that it's come become like that in boxing, but it is what it is. And these guys, the promoters don't want to match their guys up with anyone outside of their network. As I was reading that list of Haney, Cambosos, Lomachenko, uh, Cambosos, uh, right there. He's fighting Haney, Cambosos. That's a great one. Look at that's that guy. A, that's an awesome fight. Uh, but those guys, like, I, I just look at all the different different promoters, and I think like it takes a mountain, like moving mountains, trying to get these fights scheduled. And um, thank God we're getting a good one with Devin Haney, and I think we have him coming up on the show, if I'm not mistaken. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My friend, the greatest PR man in Fred boxing, Sternberg. Fred Sternberg. See his name's out there. Already. <laughs> um, well, when he, you said he was coming, he was I was like, only on. Fred would arrange that. Fred comes through with everything. He's yeah. the best. No, Fred. Fred's the best for a reason, and uh, and he's a friend, and he's a good person. So yeah, it looks like we'll we'll be getting Haney on. Hopefully, uh, it, it seems that way, and um, it'll be great. It'll be great because I like Haney. Listen, he's a he's a terrific technical fighter. He. He does everything. I don't think there's anything you can really pick that he does wrong, like really magnify. I mean, he's he's a picturesque boxer. I mean, real fast hands, sharpshooter. Um, he looks the part. Yeah, yeah, he looks like what a so. boxer. He looks what a boxer should look like. <laughs> yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Like that's what a boxer should look like. Um, obviously, he's going over there to Australia. It should be very interesting. He's going into the champions, you know, home grounds. Um, to try to bring the that that belt back, uh, it should be a very interesting scene over there. A very interesting fight. We might have to fire up the jet, Teddy, to go down there. I don't know if my jet is going to make it all the way to Australia. It might not get us across the ocean, but we should look into that. If anyone's going and has two seats for us on their jet, we'll come with you. Listen, if your jet does isn't you know the one to go there, use your other jet because <laughs> right, yeah. right. I mean, you got a hanger. You have a hanger there <laughs> at, at at Ken's yeah. uh, palace. I'll do a and, deal and, with anyone who can get us down there. Uh, who can get us a flight down there? We'll get the tickets. All we need is a lift back and forth, and we'll we'll provide the ringside seats. How's that for a trade? <laughs> I'm putting it out there. Hey, listen, I want to finish capping this fight yeah unless you have something else to add i want no, to finish no, no. capping this this fight with um quoting valdez and at the end of the day stevenson you could quote the great floyd mayweather <laughs> really uh you could you could use one of his famous quotes really to cap the night and again it's not knocking anyone it's just telling the truth um, as Floyd would say, easy money. That that that's the best way I could sum up that night. You know, was easy money. Yep, easy money for Stevenson because of the styles. Everything I just explained. Um, because of the style, his temperament, his 
his ability, the the difference in styles. Um, it it just you know, it, it matched up as I'm not going to say an impossibility, but it matched up as trying to climb Mount Everest without spikes for 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 Mr. Valdez. I mean that's that was the disparity in abilities and in styles. Uh, that it was. It, it really would be like watching somebody try to climb Mount Everest without a rope and spikes <laughs> and oxygen. Yep. I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's an unenviable task. Put it that way. Yeah. Um, boxing a guy with this kind of style, and that's and like I said, I think he's pretty much. I think he's pretty. He he hasn't been tested yet. I'll say it again to know really what's inside. I think that I know that the right thing's inside. I do, I do, but to really truly say, and I already gave my breakdown explaining myself, but to really say that he's got that stuff inside him, we'll find out one day. Because if he stays around long enough and fights the better fighters, the top fighters, you know, uh, different style fighters. Um, and, and it's going to have to be up in the 135-pound class at least. If he does that, we will have a night where we will get an answer to our question. Right now, though, fighting these guys, we only have more questions. Yeah. Well, we're going to get an answer about, uh, to your point about Devin Haney coming up because he is stepping up and going down to Australia, and that's the way it should be. Cambosos came over here, won the titles. He earned the right to have to, to be able to defend it at home. I agree. And credit agree. to Haney for being like, let's go. I'll be right down. I agree. Send me the date. I love it. I, I genuinely Behaving want to like go a to fighter. Th- Behaving like a champion. Yeah. I, I actually really want to go to this fight. I've never been to Australia, and I've got some friends down there. But one thing that, um, you, that he should be aware of is in traveling all the way over there to Australia he should not skip a single day with the athletic greens that's a huge component to that fight is that travel takes a lot out of you I would argue I've said it before you probably need an hour a a day per hour of time change to get fully acclimated and up to speed and for a fight of that magnitude I would go over and above what what that that requirement if it were me I'd be there for you know several weeks before that fight and um, yeah like I said athletic greens please check them out they're a huge sponsor of the show and as I've been saying like Teddy said I'm 70 years old I take athletic greens every single day i'm gonna put a post on my instagram page please follow me i think my name is ken rideout on instagram i'm gonna post something and run a caption contest whoever sends whoever reposts this and puts the coolest caption whatever you think captures the essence of athletic greens i'm gonna send you two months of athletic greens to try Um, whether you're a subscriber or not two months of athletic greens again I think it's an insurance policy for your health and immunity system. It tastes great. You take it in the morning. You get all your fruits and vegetables for the day. Athleticgreens.com. Use the promo code ATLAS and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. I'm also going to run the same contest with one of my new favorite products, an energy drink called Feel Free. It's a kava root-based herbal tonic. I take this before I run. I take it especially before races. Um, Creates like a bit of a euphoric feeling. I think it gives me a little bit of energy. I can't argue with the results. I've run faster every time I've taken it. Feel free. Check them out. Search feel free. Um, Use the promo code ATLAS on this one. They'll give you 40% off the first purchase. 40% off is a steal. Check them out. Again, I'm going to put up a post on Instagram. Please go to my Instagram page. We'll share it on the fight um, Instagram page as well caption contest whoever comes up with the coolest catchiest caption i'm going to send you a box of feel free for free so again in the world you know my friend uh trey hardy the great uh decathlon world champ greatest athlete in the world for a time he put me on to this stuff please check it out feel free use the promo code atlas for 40 percent off your first purchase teddy huge fight coming up this weekend huge fights plural per usual the ufc is putting on a banger of a show headlined by the great charles Oliveira against Justin Gaethje, who's just an absolute killer. Fights. We got Rose Namajunas on the on the co-main against Carla Esperanza. 
I love Rose. There's nothing to not like about Rose Namajunas. Michael Chandler, Tennessee zone, Nashville. Michael Chandler taking on Tony Ferguson, the wild card. Ferguson had a rough outing his last time. Uh, we'll see how he bounces back. Um, and then and then the opening fight, Cowboy Cerrone is fighting the legend Joe Lozon. Joe Lozon seems like he's been around for 100 years. I think he might have participated in the ultimate fighter number one. Honestly, I feel like he's been around since the UFC has been around. Consistent, constantly tough. But to the point earlier about fighters not having Cerrone's have a sp- no spring chicken either. No. <laughs> he's been around. What a, what a tough son of a gun. They all are. But here's the point I wanted to make. How many losses do you think? Take a guess. How many losses do you think Cerrone has? I'd say uh, 14. 16. Lows on. 16 losses. But I'll tell you one thing. They could See, have I'm lo- closer than most people would be because I understand what it's not a death sentence losing a fight in the UFC. No. As long as you can get in that ring with top guys and perform. Uh, and, and these guys, especially when they were younger, they were learning while they were losing fights. They were getting better. They were getting better. And I know people would say, oh, Dana has an unfair advantage. That's a fair comment. He does. But the problem is with boxing, you take a loss like... Uh, in in boxing, you take two guys, Haney and Cambosos. When they take a loss from that, it's going to be like the, pushing a rock up a hill to get like another competitive fight after that because the other top guys are going to be like, all right, we can disregard the guy who lost. Even though style-wise... He might be an incredibly challenging fight. They're not. They're, they're not going to want to get in there with him because he's got a loss. They're not going to. They're, they're going to view it as like, oh, I'm not going to fight a guy ranked lower than me, and it just creates this per, this like perpetual cycle of reinforcing to people, I don't want to take a loss. I don't want to be in that guy's position. He can't get another fight because he's super dangerous. He's un- He's incredibly talented. Why should I risk taking an L myself? I'd rather fight the champion. The reason why our friend Poirier won the title won fights, won the interim title, got the huge fights and and just knocked it out of the park with the biggest star in the business, McGregor. The reason why he got to the level that he could get those demand, uh, be given those kind of fights is because his skill levels kept improving even when he lost. He took fights with guys Dangerous fight, risky fights. He won most of them. He lost some of them. But what happened was he improved. He got forged by the fire. He got better. And what it did was it put him in position A to get another top fight. But here's the most important thing. It put him in position to win it when he got it. That's what... That's what it did by fighting top guys, not being afraid to take those, and not only being afraid to take those fights, but to take the loss that might come with the risk of fighting those level fighters. But the reward was greater than the risk because you learned how to fight. You got better. And by getting better, you were going to one day beat Conor McGregor twice. And make a lot of money. That's a perfect example, Teddy, because he took a loss, a bad loss to McGregor. And guess what? He went back to the drawing board, got better. And either Connor hasn't gotten better or he's gotten worse because then Dustin beat the brakes off him twice. And, you know, two same two guys, just a couple years difference from the last, from the time they fought. And, uh, you know, Dustin took the loss and, and, and went back to the drawing board and got better. And same thing with Khabib. I think he makes more money. I think Dustin makes more money now per fight than he ever did. And, and you know, he suffered some losses. He got the loss to Charles, lost to Khabib, but he's losing to the champion. And he's right there on the precipice. He held the interim title and he just keeps showing up and yeah to your point he's the perfect example of how a loss doesn't necessarily have to be a detriment it sucks at the time but if you're a champion you learn from it you get better you come back stronger unfortunately in boxing i think people would love to do that but they know if you do have that loss some of this stuff is out of your control if the promoter isn't going to give you offer you the fights and the opponents aren't going to want to get in there with you it's very easy for them to avoid you and act like this to all the promoters 100 percent. listen i'm going to add one thing to that magnificent card you just, you know, talked about, and you just uh, talked about that it's coming up on UFC this weekend uh, that you just publicized. The difference between that card and what it's going to wind up being and the kind of action that's going to be in that octagon 
and what happened Saturday night with Valdez and Stevenson. This is the difference. This is it. Yeah, Stevenson and Valdez were two undefeated fighters, two top fighters, two champions in their own right. No doubt. The matchmaking. See, there's a science to it. They, they, these, these guys don't get it sometimes. These promoters, these matchmakers, these TV networks uh, who depend on these guys to get it right, they don't get it right. The matchmaking is so important, Ken. You can have a great fighter, but if you put him in there with the wrong style, it's not going to be a great fight. See, that's the difference. These are going to be great fights. You know why? The styles. Yeah, some of them have losses. Yeah, they're not undefeated, all of them. But the most important thing is the styles, the matchmaking UFC does in putting the right styles together will guarantee a great fight. Will guarantee that people come back for more. Will guarantee that people leave Saturday night from that venue, from their TV sets, being satisfied. Not that they just saw guys go in there that was promoted that they had undefeated records and they had titles. Satisfied that they saw competitive fights. They saw great fights, great action. That's the difference. That's the difference. There's 15 fights on that UFC card. You know how many are undefeated? Matchmaking so important. None. Two. There's there's one woman on the early undercards that's 8-0-2. Oh, Other than that, not one single fighter undefeated. I understand how it works. I understand what I'm talking about. And that's why I'm saying the matchmaking. That's the difference. That's the difference, you guys. With the UFC and watching a fight on ESPN or or you know whatever the networks, there's only like three or four of them out there now, right? I mean, you got PBC with Al Heyman, uh, you got you got the Zone, of course, with Eddie Hearn. Uh, the La Jolla is hanging on by his string, and um, <laughs> <laughs> that would what, be what, that what? would be that would be generous. Oh, hey, you got uh, ESPN. You know, get that movie. People like the movie re references, right, Ken? Yep. Right? Yep. They they like the movie references, Rob. References, Rob. Get out the one from Jerry Maguire. Oh, this is a good one. Where <laughs> Louis Cuba's Jr. Am I saying his name right? Cuba, I love him. He's Cuba a, Gooding Jr. Yeah, Cuba Gooding Jr. Um, with with uh, with what's his name? Tom with, Cruise. Uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Where your younger lookalike when you were in way yeah, back yeah, in the yeah, day yeah. when they had a young well, Tom Cruise well, slash yeah, Teddy exactly. Atlas in the ring. <laughs> well, they used to make that mistake a lot, but um, <laughs> but now they they make it with you, um, but. It, get the scene, uh, Rob. The fans are gonna love it. Get the scene where Cuba Jr. is in the locker room. I think it's in the locker room. Yeah, he's in um, the shower. Uh, in the shower, and and he says to McGuire, is having a tough time. You know, McGuire, uh, he's, <laughs> he's having a tough the time. Balls right? of his ass for sure. He's on the balls <laughs> of his backside. He is, and and he's trying to, and and he's like pleading with. He's saying all this stuff. He's saying all all this stuff. And Cuba Jr. It was great. It was great. He looks at him. He's <laughs> he's laughing. He's like, oh, he says, "I love it." And then you're hanging on by a string, Jerry. You're hanging on. You're hanging on by a string. You know, as staying his agent. You know, because he had nobody left. He was the only client he had left. And he says, "I just love it. I love it, Jerry. Jerry, I love it. The way you're hanging on. You're hanging on there, Jerry. You know." And Jerry's like, "Oh, you know, uh, freak it. Let me get out of here. You know, yeah. I love it, Jerry. I love it. <laughs> I love it. You're hanging on. You're hanging in there, Jerry." Uh, well, Oscar's hanging in there. <laughs> he's hanging. He's hanging by a thread. He's hanging by a thread. Yep. He's hanging by a thread. He might have to take that fight with Jake Paul. You know what I mean? He might. I mean, I hope he doesn't for his sake, because that there's no coming back from that. Although after some of the pictures that have floated around to him, I don't even think he cares anymore. Anything to make a dollar. 
Hey, um, one thing that you pointed out earlier about the people that were listening to the last two predictions on uh, going to my bookie would have made a little, a couple extra shekels this weekend to offset the price of this uh, some of these pay per views. But with the UFC, you know you're going to be disappointed. And for the guys at my bookie, and if you and if you like to gamble and gamble responsibly, you can go to mybookie.ag and use the promo code Atlas. They'll give you fifty percent deposit, fifty percent credit on your first deposit up to a thousand bucks. So if you put in two thousand they'll give you a thousand dollars to bet with for free and uh, hopefully you can take advantage and leverage that um that deposit and make some smart bets like going to the casino somebody hand you chips before you walk in the door right yeah say here yep and again please uh, all joking aside gamble responsibly yeah, don't bet yeah, money you can't afford to lose but if you like to gamble i think my bookie provides a great product and for the people at my bookie and like to play teddy the line on the main event justin gaethje uh, Charles Oliveira, plus money on Gaethje, plus 150, minus 180 on Charles Oliveira. What do you like? Well, Oliveira, the old timers would say, Ken, you know, he's been around a long time and he finally got the title. When you win the title, you improve 30%. I he's, believe that. And he looks like he I, gets I, better every I, fight. I, I, I believe that. I, I, I love Gaethje. Yeah, talk about styles. It's only going to be a great fight because of the style of Gagey, because of his approach, because of his attitude, because of his mentality. Uh, same thing with Oliveira. Um, it's it's going to be a back and forth fight. Uh, I, I I would not be shocked by an upset, but I'm going to go with the champion, uh, Oliveira, because based on what I just said, all my years in the sport, the old timers were right. You see a guy win a title, he finally gets the title. Uh, and a thirty percent improvement immediately, immediately, uh, just just by winning the title. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that. And uh, but would I be shocked to see uh, to see my man Gagey uh, wind up leaving that ring with the title? No, no. And again, that's what you love about the UFC. You can make an honest, legitimate argument for both guys to win the fight. That's what makes for good fights. Right there. Right there. See, going into the Vargas Stevenson fight. Now, I'm not being a Monday morning quarterback. I'm never that. I'm a lot of things. And people will tell you that. <laughs> yeah, not all good, maybe. But I'm not that. I'm not going to tell you something after the fact. I'm going to be consistent with what I said before they got in the ring. I, that fight, I didn't think you could make an argument who was going to win. For the Katie Taylor and Serrano, yes, yes. But for the Vargas Stevenson fight, no. You for me, you couldn't make an argument. Only one guy was going to win that fight. Only one guy, and I already explained why Stevenson was going to win it. But for this fight on the UFC card, Gagey and Oliveira, you could make a damn good argument for either side. Well, how about this over under over one and a half rounds minus one eighty five for the under. You get plus one fifty five. One and a half rounds well, not, on a, not over under. under. You mean for the over, right? For the under, you're getting plus money, plus 155. If you think it's going over, one and a half rounds minus 185. But that's a super low over under, one and a half rounds. I mean, I guess they think the only way I think. Explosive. That, yeah, explosive. Which I think is the only way Gaethje wins this fight is to be explosive. I think if it goes longer, the longer he stays in there with Oliveira, I don't know. For me, the longer he stays in there with him, uh, the longer Charles has an opportunity to get him on the ground and grapple him. But Re Gaethje is an incredible wrestler. But I think they're standing on their and feet. Striker. Gaethje, yeah, on the feet, I think Gaethje has a huge advantage. Oliveira can handle himself on his feet too, but uh, yep. I would agree with you. Gaethje has an advantage there probably. Uh, we'll see whether or not it shows. But uh, Oliveira, he's a, oh my, he's a python on on he he he's a python on the floor. I mean he he wraps himself this way that way <laughs> this way. I mean he's like trying to really who oh, who would want to go into the jungle and and wrestle a python? <laughs> Nobody or, or an alligator. <laughs> or just, an alligator. I mean, a but a python <laughs> wraps himself this way of your legs, your neck, yeah. everything. Uh, that that guy, he's a he's he's a monster on the mat. He's a you know he he earned that title. And, um, you know, it's been a long journey for him to get to that. Uh, and to our point, he fought everybody and he lost fights um, to get to that. But because of what he went through is part of the reason why he got there. Part yeah. of the reason why he won when he got there. And then, uh, Teddy, the co-main 
We got Rose, Rose minus 200, Carla plus 160. But I really like the over under here is interesting. Four and a half, minus 185 for over, and the under at plus 155, four and a half rounds. Four and a half, huh? Yeah. Uh, four and a half for the under. You're getting what? 45, you said? Getting on, back, uh, if you think it's going under, you get back 155. 155. And rows, and are, four, two, uh, rows are two to one favorite. And what's the round number for that under four, over again? Four and a half. Yeah, I'd go with the under. I'd take a I'm shot. I'm with you. I do too. I, I, I mean, think Rose finishes know. it. Yeah, I mean. She's so good. Uh, listen, it's, uh, again, they put in competitive fights. They put competitive opponents. Um, they match up to styles. UFC, the matchmaker there, does an unbelievable job. Unbelievable job. Uh, he should get a bonus. Really, and Dana, don't, I'm not spending your money. You got a lot of it, so I couldn't spend it anyway. But um, I'm not spending your money. Obviously, you know what I think of you in the UFC. I have none but admiration. But uh, you give, you do the right thing. You give those $50,000 bonuses out there to the fighters that earn them uh, on any given night. Give, give them to the matchmaker once in a while because he earns it too. He, that's, he, he's, uh, behind, that's he's behind. Mick, Mick Maynard has been uh is the matchmaker over there it does a great job but i love that fight well that's all i got teddy you got anything else before that we reminds sign me off? i love that no you gave me something to leave here with uh you, you don't have to give me much you gave me enough uh that's all i got teddy uh, in the words of the great 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 george foreman as a human being as a fighter as a legend as a comeback artist as he said when he was in Zaire with Ali and he's throwing all these bombs all night long and it's hot, it's muggy, it's everything and, and he's getting tired and he's throwing and Ali's still there, still there and around the seventh round he whispers in his ear, they get into a clinch and Ali whispers into the ear, hey George, is that all you got? Is that all you got, George? And George says, yep, that's about it. That's it. That's what I got. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, thank you for Ken for setting me up that brilliant, brilliant way, and bring us home with that Stetson. Happy birthday, cowboy! Before we sign Happy off, my birthday, birthday presents from my wife and children. They want me to fit in down here in uh, Nashville. Figured I'd show everyone, see what we think. Shelby was like, "Do you do you want to wear it out?" I said, "I'll do you one better. I'll put it on on the show, and our million views this week will listen, will watch it, and they'll weigh in with, um, I'm sure, some scathing comments. But hopefully, some people appreciate it. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> can have a scathing con comment against you. And I'll leave you with this: You gave me something else. One more movie referral, okay? One more. I know that people love them. I'm giving it to them. Uh, my cousin Vinny, when when they were great, <laughs> Joe Pesci and and uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, who was the co-star oh, with him? Oh, um, the, uh, the the Italian girl, um, Melissa Tomei. Sam uh, tells me he's doing a great job here, uh, filming as always. Melissa Tomei. So they, she was great. What you talk about the right style matchup? They were the right style matchup for that movie. It was tremendous. But remember when they got into that town in Alabama? <laughs> you know, that, that, that redneck town, whatever you want to call it. But when they got into that town there, they pulled in, right? Two New Yorkers from Brooklyn, New York. Well, you, you can't hide it, right? The accent, everything, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, use. What are you doing? <laughs> what? what, what you, uh, use. What, what's, uh, uh, what's a ute? <laughs> Mr. Gambarini. The two Maybe, utes. Uh, those two utes over there. What's a <laughs> ute, Mr. Gambarini? You mocking me? But anyway, the, the movie referral that I'm reference I'm making is when they first got into town. And and uh <laughs> and, and then she says, I bet you the Chinese food is horrible over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're there, right? And and then he says to her, 
Come on, stop acting like this. Yeah, you you're making it obvious. We're making it obvious that we're from out of town. <laughs> and she looks at him and says, "And this is what you finished with. This is to the point that you made." She turned. She says, "Oh, like you really fit in." <laughs> like and she she threw an F word in front of her. Yeah. Like you really F and fit in. That's it. You fit in anywhere, my man. You fit in anywhere. It, Happy there. birthday. Happy birthday. Ride 'em, cowboy, and. Make Many, 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 many more. Thank you. And very keep the much. comments and keep the <laughs> comments loving. Please, yeah. you fans out there, and please Rob. do me a favor <laughs> for his birthday. Please. And Rob, here's your screenshot for the uh, for the thumbnail this week. <laughs> the gentleman fighter teddy thanks for doing this appreciate you as always um guys thanks for tuning in oh i almost forgot how could i forget thursday thursday please remember we have a fight plan coming up for bevel versus the great canelo the golden goose is in action we filmed a whole fight plan at the trinity boxing club per usual our home away from home I think you're going to really enjoy this one. Teddy gives a full breakdown on what to expect from each fighter and what each guy has to do to win. Um, I love those fight plans, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, you know, as always, please like and subscribe. Leave some comments. Let us know what you think of the fight plan when it goes up Thursday evening. And, um, yeah, we'll be back Monday to do a full breakdown. we got an awesome UFC card and Canelo in action. It's like a... You know, it's like a Christmas Christmas uh, holiday with this weekend with all the fights coming up. So see you guys on Monday. Don't forget Thursday. We got the fight plan coming up. Take care.